All right, today we're going to take a look at the nervous system, lecture 10. I've just included some interesting art images. This is a monoprint of the central nervous system and just another interesting image of synapses. We're going to take a look at we're going to take a look at the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is separated into the sensory division and the motor division. In the sensory division, we have afferent information ascending to the brain and in the motor division we have efferent output. The motor division then has two divisions, the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system we don't have conscious control over and the somatic nervous system we do have conscious control over. Within this then, within the autonomic nervous system, we take a look at two divisions within it, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. So the sympathetic division is fight or flight, and the parasympathetic division is rest and digest. Here's some images of if we were to dissect out an entire nervous system. This would include central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, kind of an interesting set of images. The central nervous system then is comprised of the brain and spinal cord and we again we have the afferent or the sensory neurons and the efferent or the motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system. One of the issues that we can take a look at is within the peripheral nervous system we have these nerves that branch all the way out to the tips of our toes and the tips of our fingers. Sometimes we can run into issues with those. For instance carpal tunnel syndrome and the median nerve usually being involved within pain within this issue. If we need to have some repair done in that area, we could have a median nerve block to go ahead and perform any surgery that needs to be performed if we need some kind of a release on the retinaculum. If we have more extensive work that needs to be done within, say, the forearm, within the radius and ulna or the hand, we might have a nerve block that happens at the ulnar nerve. This is our classic example of a neuron, and we have the cell body. This is our classic example of a neuron, and the neuron then is comprised of the cell body, and we have a nucleus containing the genetic information. We also have dendrites that send information into the cell body, and we have an axon hillock, and the axon hillock is considered to be this triangular area here. This would be the axon hillock. And then we have an axon which travels from the axon hillock all the way down to the axon terminals. The axon then in a myelinated axon we see these tic-tac like structures and these are Schwann cells and in between each one of those Schwann cells is a gap that we refer to as a node of Ron VA. In the body of a neuron we have integration. We also have then action potential initiation at the axon hillock and we have ac action potential conduction down the axon where then we have neurotransmitter release at our axon terminals. Another interesting image of C of neurons, axons, dendrites. Here we're going to take a look at the other components that are around neurons as well within our nervous system. Nerves then, when we actually see a nerve on dissection, we're seeing bundles of these axons. They're bundled in a, in a very definite fashion. We have an epineurium. So whenever we see epi, we know that we are above. And in this section, we'll be taking a look at anything newer is, is going to be neuron, nervous system, any of that. So epineurium is this outer covering. Then within that we have these bundles, the fascicles like what we've seen in, in muscle tissue, and those then are covered by the perineurium. And then we see the axons themselves being covered by the endoneurium. So this little piece coming out here this is going to be a, a myelinated axon covered by endoneurium. The myelination then Myelination is an insulation. If we think about an electrical type of cable, myelination would be the insulation that's on that cable. The insulation then is, is made with the Schwann cells and they wrap around the axon. This is a really interesting image of a cross section. This blue area in here would be the portion of the axon that we see and wrapped around it these rings 
would be a Schwann cell or a myelin sheath. But whenever we see damage that happens, say through some kind of a destructive disease, like for instance, what we see through multiple sclerosis, for instance, multiple sclerosis, a sclerosis would be a scar and is an attack on this myelination that then exposes the axon and creates misfirings or, or mistransmissions of any of our nerve impulses. Myelination in the central nervous system then is handled by oligodendrocytes. So in the peripheral nervous system, we have myelination that we take a look at as a Schwann cell. And in the central nervous system, we look at that same insulation as an oligodendrocyte. Saltatory conduction is an item that we're going to take a look at. It's illustrated really nicely in some videos that come up next. It's this idea that we have these areas that are going to propagate an action potential. And so we don't have to propagate an action potential all the way down the entire axon by opening all of these ion channels. We can just open the gates at each of these nodes of Ronvier and more speedily transmit our current down the axon. This is an interesting image of a node of Ronvier. These little gaps here that we see are nodes of Ronvier and actual axons, and another image that has those in it as well. In this section, we take a look at three different types of neurons. The multipolar neuron is the most predominant neuron, and then the next neuron that we'll take a look at are bipolar neurons, and then we'll look at pseudo-unipolar neurons. When we get into the brunt of what the, our brains are made of, the majority of the mass within our brain is actually neuroglia. So again, we see our neuro root, and we see glia, and glia equals glue. And we have four neuroglial cells, astrocytes, microglial cells, oligodendrocytes, which we just looked at, and ependymal cells. Astrocytes, then, are star-shaped. They have a great diversity of function. They have glial end feet that provide structural support for neurons, so they're kind of an infrastructure for the brain. They help guide neurons to make proper connections during development. They regulate the concentrations of extracellular potassium. They take up neurotransmitters after their release. And they can remove degenerating neurons via phagocytosis, gobbling up any damaged matter within the brain or damaged neurons. Microglia, then, are resident macrophages found near blood vessels. And when we think about a macrophage, we think about destroying bacteria and removing debris. Oligodendrocytes, then, are the myelin sheaths within the central nervous system. And ependymal cells, then, are cells that create our cerebral spinal fluid. So we're going to find those in the ventricles of the brain. And we have four ventricles of the brain. And ventricles 1 and 2 are referred to as the lateral ventricles. Then we have ventricle three and four, and we'll look at those more specifically when we break down the gross anatomy of the brain. The central canal of the spinal cord also has ependymal cells, and they contribute to formation of cerebral spinal fluid and circulate cerebral spinal fluid. Just another interesting art image of neurons and macrophage activity. Neuroglia in the peripheral nervous system then we have Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, and then we also see these satellite cells that are surrounding cell bodies, and cell bodies then would be that body of the neuron. In ganglia, we need to take a look at what ganglia are, these groups of neurons, and that brings us to our resting membrane potential discussion, and within this then, we're going to ta be taking a look at voltage and how we have a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts within the cell. This is due in large part to other elements that are within the cell that are also influenced by sodium and potassium. And so we have to take a look at how the flow of sodium and potassium and the other elements that are within the cell function to make all of this happen. Next up, what I'd like to show you are a couple of videos that display this concept really well. The human brain alone contains about 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. A neuron, like every other cell, has positively and negatively charged ions 
inside and outside. Further, a resting neuron has a greater negative charge on the inside surface of the plasma membrane and a greater positive charge on the outside surface. This partitioning of charge creates a voltage difference across the membrane known as the resting membrane potential, which can be measured using a voltmeter. On average, an intracellular electrode records a value of minus 70 millivolts. The resting membrane potential depends on two factors. First, it depends on the presence of sodium and potassium gradients across the plasma membrane. Specifically, there are more sodium ions outside the neuron than inside, and more potassium ions inside the neuron than outside. Second, the resting membrane potential depends on the differential permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. Leak channels in the plasma membrane allow sodium and potassium ions to diffuse or leak down their concentration gradients. The membrane contains many more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. Thus, the membrane is much more permeable, or leaky, to potassium ions. As positively charged potassium ions leak out of the neuron, the inside surface of the membrane becomes negatively charged compared to the outside surface. If potassium was the only ion moving, the potential would stabilize at minus 90 millivolts. However, positively charged sodium ions leak into the neuron, which slightly offsets the negative charge, and raises the voltmeter reading to minus 70 millivolts. Sodium-potassium pumps actively transport sodium ions out of the neuron and potassium ions back in, compensating for the sodium and potassium leaks. Thus, the pumps help to maintain the resting membrane potential. Neurons send signals over long distances by generating and propagating action potentials. Most action potentials originate near the axon hillock of the cell body in the initial segment of the axon. It then travels the entire length of the axon. A closer look reveals that during an action potential, voltage-gated channels open and close altering the permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium and potassium ions. A threshold stimulus changes the shape of the voltage-gated sodium channels, causing their activation gates to open. This event marks the beginning of phase one of the action potential, known as depolarization. As sodium ions diffuse into the axon, the membrane potential becomes less negative. This causes more voltage-gated sodium channels to open, and the membrane potential soars to plus 30 millivolts. At this point, two key events occur. The inactivation gates of voltage-gated sodium channels close, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events mark the beginning of phase two of the action potential known as repolarization. As potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, the membrane potential becomes negative again. However, the membrane potential continues in the negative direction going beyond the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. This marks the beginning of phase three of the action potential, known as hyperpolarization. During this phase, voltage-gated potassium channels close and all voltage-gated sodium channels are released from inactivation. By the end of this phase, ions move through leak channels only and the membrane potential returns to the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. The neuron is now ready to fire another action potential. Summary Generation of an action potential A threshold stimulus opens voltage-gated sodium channels. 
Sodium ions diffuse into the axon, depolarizing it to plus 30 millivolts. Voltage-gated sodium channels close, and voltage-gated potassium channels open. Potassium ions diffuse out of the axon, repolarizing it to a negative value. The membrane potential briefly hyperpolarizes. Voltage-gated potassium channels close, and the membrane returns to the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. Action potentials propagate in a continuous fashion in unmyelinated axons. Once an action potential is generated in the initial segment of the axon, it propagates the entire length of the axon. Recall that a threshold stimulus causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open. The influx of sodium ions generates an action potential. It also establishes a depolarizing current that flows to the next segment and brings it to threshold. Voltage-gated sodium channels open, regenerating the action potential in this segment of the axon. Current flows from this segment and depolarizes the next segment to threshold, thus regenerating the action potential yet again. In this way, regeneration continues in one direction all the way down to the axon terminals. The basis for unidirectional propagation is revealed when we take a closer look. By the end of the depolarization phase of the action potential, all voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events render this segment of the axon temporarily insensitive or refractory to another depolarizing stimulus. However, voltage-gated sodium channels in the downstream segment are closed and receptive to a depolarizing stimulus. Thus, propagation occurs sequentially down the axon to the axon terminals. In myelinated axons, action potential propagation is a bit different. Here they propagate in a saltatory or leaping fashion. The myelin sheath consists of multiple layers of tightly wrapped glial cell membrane. But this sheath is not a continuous one. Exposed areas of axonal membrane, known as nodes of Ranvier, occur at discrete intervals. Voltage-gated sodium channels are abundant in the nodes, but largely absent between nodes. So, action potentials are regenerated at each node, not in areas covered by the myelin sheath. However, the myelin sheath does provide the insulation necessary for the rapid spread of depolarizing current. And the sooner the nodes reach threshold, the faster action potentials propagate along the axon. Saltatory conduction is extremely fast, Velocities often exceed 100 meters per second. In contrast, continuous conduction is fairly slow. Velocities rarely exceed 2 meters per second. Nevertheless, both continuous and saltatory conduction propagate action potentials over varying distances because action potentials regenerate along the way. Summary Propagation of an action potential. Once generated, the action potential propagates the entire length of the axon without decrement. 